Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual panel discussion brought to you by New Mexico Healthcare Executives. My name is Stacy Kidd, Regional Director and your session host representing the National Office of the American College of Healthcare Executives. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items to help you navigate the program in our virtual environment. For the purposes of noise control, your lines will be muted for the duration of the session unless there is active discussion, at which point you may unmute yourself to talk. You can also submit questions through the chat box. This event is being recorded and will be available in your viewing um, learning management system in approximately two business days. Today's session is worth 1.5 hours of ACHE face-to-face -face education credit. To earn this credit, you must be logged in for the entire 90 minutes of the event. All attendees who meet this requirement will have their credits applied to their accounts within two weeks. We do encourage you to, to um, complete the evaluation for the event. The evaluation link is now in the chat box, so please visit the link before we close out today's session. Now to begin, I will turn it over to Stetson Berg. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to NMHE's uh, second event of the year. I'm excited to have all of you here. Um, for those of you who are new or maybe joining our first event during the pandemic, we're able to have these virtually, and we look forward to having these in person once it's safe to meet. We have a really exciting list of panelists to uh, give a presentation today. They're each going to talk for probably 10 or so minutes, and then we're going to jump into a panel discussion and then on to questions and answers. Feel free to type your questions in the chat box. We can always address them later. Um, I'm going to be kicking off the event, but Angelica is going to chime in in probably 30 minutes or so and take over, and we look forward to working with you. So I'm going to start off with introducing um, Donnie Quintana first, and everyone, I may butcher your introductions. Please add anything that I may have missed. I have pared down your bios. We have such an incredible uh, list of panelists today that if I said everything that was on their bios, it would be the whole 90 minutes. So I cut it down to sort of some hot tips and they'll fill you in. So Donnie is the division director of the local government division of the state of New Mexico Department of Finance Administration. He had a 36 year military career. Colonel Quintana has served in a variety of leadership positions, logistics and operations during that time. He served 20 years with the state of New Mexico Economic Development Division as the deputy director and community business development team leader. And also Colonel Quintana earned his bachelor's of accountancy with a minor in economics from the New Mexico State University and graduated from the Inter-American Defense War College. Thank you, Donnie. Uh, Mark R. Hayden, uh, CPO and State Purchasing Division Director of the New Mexico General Services Department. Mark serves as the State Purchasing Director and has since January 2019. He has more than 30 years experience as an attorney, including private corporations and government practice. He was previously state purchasing attorney and legal services bureau chief for four years following his service as an associate general counsel at the New Mexico Human Services Department. He practiced for more than 20 years as a corporate counsel for CAN Insurance and five years as a litigator in Chicago law firms. He's graduated from the University of Wisconsin Law School, where he was an editor and has received a political science degree and studied engineering. Another panelist of ours is Stephen Stoddard. He is the executive director of the New Mexico Rural Hospital Network, which is a collaborative organization consisting of 10 rural hospitals with the mission to support and sustain quality health care. He serves as the board and on the board and past president of the National Cooperative of Healthcare Networks. He's a fellow of the American College of Healthcare Executives and has served as president of the Idaho Healthcare Executive Forum. He joined ACHE over 20 years ago, has maintained activity uh, throughout his career locally and nationally. Thanks, Stephen. He's also serving on our board at NMHE as well as the regent for this chapter and the southern chapter. 
Another wonderful panelist of ours is Kimberly A. Medley. She's the Director of Materials Management at Artesia General Hospital. Kimberly has proudly served Artesia General for the last 10 years, with her most recent four years as Director of Materials Management. She moved here from Roosevelt, Utah in 2003 to Artesia and has done a wide range of inventory purchasing and procurement jobs. She's currently studying at the University of Phoenix and will receive her Associates in Business Fundamentals. It looks like this March. Congratulations on that, Kimberly. And then she's moving on to Bachelors of Business and hopefully graduating in mid-2023. So it sounds like she's been quite busy with school during all of this and is also working towards her uh, Certified Materials and Professional Certification, CMRP. And certainly last but not least, Renee Ayala is the Quality Manager of Infection Prevention for the UNM Medical Group. She has 13 years of experience in healthcare, serving in a variety of roles from tech and hospital laboratory, quality and regulatory. She completed her undergraduate coursework in clinical laboratory science from UNM and went on to earn an MBA with honors from Capella University. I think she recently graduated from that too. There was a memo sent out not long ago. So congratulations as well, Renee. She's spent nine years working and managing various aspects of the clinical laboratories for SED and Quest. She's also served as a peer inspector for the College of American Pathologists, oversees quality improvement efforts at, has overseen these at Loveless, and then, of course, like I said earlier, currently serves as the quality manager of infection prevention for the medical group um, with oversight for all of those fun pieces. So I think we have a fabulous panel for you today, and they're going to start off by giving presentations for a couple minutes. I'm going to be controlling a few of them. Um, Donnie or Mark, I forget which one of you was going first, and I'll share your slides. Looks like Donnie. Let's see, is that working, Donnie? And you're muted. Can you hear me? You got it. Yes. Okay, great. Great. Uh, Stenson, thank you so much uh, for that introduction. And uh, Thank you and Stacy for giving me the opportunity to participate this morning. Uh, what a great opportunity. And uh, what I'd like to do this morning is give you a very succinct presentation on what a, one aspect of the state's response to the COVID-19. And that was uh, the implementation and the operation of contact tracing and how that triggered um, many logistics as well as decision points. So. With that, uh, if we can go to the next slide. Are you seeing the test process timeframes? Uh, actually, what I see in front of me is just the introduction slide. Okay, I'm going to stop, see if I can stop share. I'm doing this from a Mac today, which is what I typically do not work with. So forgive me, everyone. Let's see. No problem. Thank you, Stetson. And as you do that, Stetson, I guess uh, one of the things I definitely want to convey to the group is, you know, the whole, the whole intention or the main objective of contact tracing really was to save lives. It was really to make sure that we could implement a system and a process to prevent the spread of the disease and the virus uh, by implementing, implementing a contact tracing system that would reach out to New Mexicans and uh, let them know that they, they had tested positive and or that they, they had been exposed to somebody that had tested positive and therefore uh, ask them to quarantine if they had been exposed and asked them to self-isolate if they had tested positive. So again, the main objective was really to save lives and stop the spread of the virus. So, and, and part working? of it was through obviously 
contact tracing was a, a key component of contact tracing was the ability to capture data. Uh, we really wanted to get as much information as we could on the actual individuals themselves so that uh, we can have, have an idea of what the spread could look like and possibly how it was spreading across our state, as well as provide information to the CDC and more importantly, be able to try to mitigate to the best of our ability where we think the spread was going and uh, to be able to stop it at that location. So obviously data collection was a huge component of our strategy and our ability to accomplish our objectives. So next slide, please. And did it move to test process, Donnie? It did. Yeah, All I right, we're in business. Great. Yeah, I think fundamentally, this is truly the framework on how the process worked. And, you know, I think it was kind of interesting that on the onset, folks would refer to the sample collection points as the testing location. And actually that, that you know, that was an error. Uh, the reality is, is the sample collection point was these various locations where we had tremendous amount of support with our public health uh, workers going out there and actually uh, drawing the sample. And in order to do that, they had to have adequate sample swabs and test tubes and all the things that they needed. And, you know, definitely you're going to hear from um, uh, Director Mark Hayden in regards to all the PPE requirements that were driven by the fact that we had these health practitioners at these multiple sites doing the sample collection. In addition to that, uh, you know, obviously they were collecting thousands of samples in, in any given day and it triggered transportation logistic requirements because as we had all these various trans, uh, sample collection points scattered throughout the state, we had to get those swab collections to various laboratories throughout New Mexico, predominantly the scientific laboratory division, uh, which is part of the Department of Health in Albuquerque, as well as TRICARE and a couple of others. So we definitely had to embark on a transportation system and capitalize on logistics to ensure that we could get the sample collections to the actual laboratories where the laboratories could actually run the, the test and so forth. That definitely triggered the necessity to ensure that we had adequate uh, staffing and workforce uh, at these laboratories to be able to get the test results and as quickly as possible, get them into the system. And as you see within the framework there, that uh, once the sample collection was uh, at the laboratory, it went into a queue. And I think uh, you probably are all very familiar with the NIMIC or New Mexico Health uh, apologize, I can't remember what the I and the C stand for, but nonetheless, it is the mechanism or the system that develop, uh, that all testing results run through on an automated basis uh, before they go into the Department of Health's database. Um, so once the test results were finalized, and if it was a positive test result, it would go to NIMIC, and then from there, it would go into the database that we created to allow us to be able to contact those individuals that had tested positive. And uh, once we were able to make that initial conversation and capture some information, data on medical and things to that nature, we were also uh, had the opportunity to ensure that we captured anybody that they felt that they had been in contact with the last two weeks so that we could trigger the second follow-up phone call, which was to the exposed contacts to let them know that they had been exposed again to somebody that tested positive. And I really just wanted to present this slide to you to show you that throughout the process, there were very, mu um, very much areas that were triggered that would require certain logistics. And again, Mark would definitely go into that in much greater detail, but in order even to just support this effort, the contact tracing effort required a tremendous amount of contracts and uh, logistics and PPE again, uh, making sure that we had adequate, adequate swabs, making sure that we had adequate transportation support. And uh, to that note, we actually would fly some of the swab collections for the northern part of the state via the New Mexico Air Civil Patrol. Uh, they would fly the sample collections to Albuquerque so that they could get tested as quickly as, as possible so that we would notify folks 
quickly that they were positive and so forth. So uh, next slide, please. Again, you know, I, I think, you know, the reality here is again, uh, working in collaboration with the existing DOH system, which we definitely acknowledged at the time uh, was, was kind of antiquated in regards to having the ability to get us all the data that we needed uh, in such a short time frame to ensure that we could adequately identify folks that were positive, get them to self-isolate, and therefore uh, possibly minimize the spread of the, of the disease and, uh, and therefore really mitigate some of the risks to the remaining uh, population of the state of New Mexico. So next slide, please. Here's kind of just a flow chart, if you will, uh, on how, you know, once we had a record uh, that was open in regards to a positive test, the various steps that it went through within the system to ensure that we were reaching out and contacting. Uh, our goal, our objective was to be able to reach out to at least 80% of those folks that had been tested and get their test results to them as quickly as possible. Obviously there were folks uh, you know, across the spectrum that uh, either didn't want a phone call from Department of Health, didn't want to answer questions and or uh, were you know, feeling bad enough that they really couldn't take a phone call. But uh, to the greatest extent possible, we really wanted to implement this process. It uh, required having a call center established so that we could take uh, in, inbound calls, outbound calls, we developed a uh, text message so that if you were tested and your test result came back negative, you could get your test result by buying into the system and uh, we'd send you a, a text message. You would hit one, acknowledging that you were amenable to get your test result. Immediately thereafter, your test result was given to you. Uh, we did not notify anybody that was positive other than with the contact tracing folks that would make the phone call. So no test results were uh, provided via text message. Uh, I do believe they've modified the system to date and they are doing that, but back uh, on the originality of the system, we did not do that. Uh, next slide, please. Again, this is just kind of a continuation of it, uh, the flow, and it required an extensive amount of coordination. Uh, I tell folks, I don't believe, I don't think they had an appreciation for how comprehensive and how complex it was to be able to just implement something working obviously with the Department of Health, working with all the rural uh, public health facilities, the hospitals scattered throughout the state and working with epidemiologists and so forth to ensure that we had uh, the best data and were providing the best results across the state. Next slide. This, this is just a continuation uh, of the information and so forth. Uh, next slide. And uh, obviously, you know, it gave us an opportunity to uh, be visionary and more importantly, uh, consider what implementations of systems, data, processes, and protocols needed to be uh, updated and implemented to not only meet the uh, COVID-19 crisis, but to prepare the state to be adequately to be able to respond uh, in the future of future viruses and things to that nature. So we're better prepared and have the ability to support the logistics and things to that nature. Next slide. And I think it's important to really uh, acknowledge the fact, one of the, the largest challenge to the state of New Mexico in its response to COVID-19 was being able to adequately safeguard and assist our Native American population uh, scattered throughout the state. Uh, obviously uh, they are a sovereign uh, governments and uh, uh, required that we enact certain protocols, uh, capitalizing on certain hospitals support and uh, leveraging and partnering and so forth. So I think it was important because it triggered additional uh, logistical support that was needed to be able to reach out to this segment of the population across New Mexico. And again, I think Mark will probably address some of the challenges and some of the successes and opportunities that arose as a result of uh, making sure that we adequately address these concerns. Next slide, please. And again, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, here's the, there was uh, definitely uh, a, uh, a requirement to modify and uh, amend some of the processes to ensure that
that we worked with various organizations, uh, the federal government, uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs, um, uh, tribal medical hospitals and so forth. And uh, obviously that required a lot of communication and uh, support logistically. Next slide, please. This is my last slide. And what I really wanted to just kind of illustrate to you uh, as you saw the slide earlier about just the general population and the sample collection process and the timeline. This was for the Navajo area. And uh, you can see that if it was 24 to 48 hours for the general population to go from sample collection to the laboratory to actual identification of a positive test result, it was taking us early on 97 hours to do the same thing with our Native American population because of the unique challenges. So again, you know, uh, I recognize that uh, the contact tracing was just one aspect of the state's response. I think again, you know, understanding and appreciating the fact that uh, the effort was really to save lives was our goal. And more importantly, or just as importantly was to prevent the spread of the virus. So with that, thank you for the opportunity to share this information with you. I can tell you that uh, it was a tremendous learning opportunity. And more importantly, it was a great opportunity to be able to know that we were assisting our fellow New Mexicans through an effort. And uh, I was pleased to be able to have that opportunity to participate. And again, thank you so much, Stetson and Stacy. And uh, we'll stand fast for the other presenters and available for any questions that anybody may have. So with that, thank you so much. Thanks, Donnie. We'll get to pepper you with questions soon. Let's see, does Mark, did this show up correctly? Okay, I'm unmuted now. Yes, let me, uh, let me exit full screen here. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm Mark Hayden, director of New Mexico State Purchasing, as, in, uh, as Stetson had mentioned, a, a recovering attorney as well. Uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to present today. Not many citizens know what we do or how we do it. Donnie and I do our job quietly and not many, uh, not many folks have a peek into our world. So, so this is a, a nice opportunity for us to share. Uh, the question we were asked by the college was what, do we, what did we do to protect our employees and optimize delivery of the services for the state during the pandemic? Um, I'll touch on that, but we'll, we'll stand for questions afterward. Um, state purchasing is a support agency. We help agencies like Department of Health obtain goods and services to perform their missions uh, through solicitations uh, in compliance with the New Mexico Procurement Code. Why don't you um, advance to the next slide, Stetson? Okay, there's the question. Um, go to the next slide, please. So, we, we follow the New Mexico Procurement Code, and that's designed to be competitive, open, transparent, and maximize the state taxpayer value. Uh, we don't necessarily move as quickly as we could if somebody ran out with a credit card and bought something, but there's a reason for that. We wanna reduce the fraud. We want to get competitive prices. We wanna give opportunity to other businesses. So we have a process in place that does exactly that. Um, we are located in the Montoya building in the Santa Fe South Capitol Complex. And in week four of March, 2020, we shut down our building and all divisions were sent home. That week we purchased laptops, cell phones, hotspots for all employees who didn't ha already have them. All desk phones were forwarded to the cell phones for continuation as customer service. Uh, then we did something that I was advocating, advocating for a year or two prior to the pandemic, and that's requiring all procurements to be submitted online, along with the bid openings conducted by video. Um, never waste a pandemic. Uh, we're all continuing to work from home, and we may decide that we won't be returning to work as normal uh, following the pandemic. We're evaluating our footprint, reducing leases and consolidating office space. We'll have to see how this uh, evolves over time, but uh, the world has changed and so have we. Next slide, please. All right, the state spends approximately $6 billion each year in goods and services. 
State Purchasing Division awards hundreds of statewide price agreements to businesses each year through a competitive procurement process under the code. These price agreements are convenient because they can be used by all state agencies and local public bodies throughout the state to buy common items and services without having to conduct their own procurement. We've already done that work for them. The agencies, they write purchase orders against those agreements and then can select the best supplier uh, from multiple awards on those agreements uh, for such items as PPE and medical supplies. Next slide. So what happened after March of last year? So all state and federal governments placed simultaneous orders to the awarded contractors for the same PPE and medical supplies in larger quantities than had ever been seen before. They didn't have enough to go around. Many manufacturers were overseas, products were diverted to Korea or stayed in China or India, ships couldn't sail from the docks and basically shipping was shut down. So with no product to deliver, the price agreements with suppliers like the Grangers and the McKessons of the world were no longer useful because their supply chains were broken. They thought they could deliver. We, we were promised product and it just didn't arrive. Uh, the vendors quickly found out they, they couldn't deliver. And then what happens next? Well, the state of New Mexico, along with other states, turned to the open market for supplies. The problem was there was no national coordination for existing supplies and each state and local government was on their own. Um, next slide. So what was the impact of what happened? Well, there was chaotic bidding wars breaking out between all the states and we even competed with FEMA, which uh, you know, if you have a limited supply, it just keeps driving up the cost. There were no price controls, contracts didn't work, states went to the open market, cash up front to the highest bidder became the new norm. So without contracts governing the transactions, vendor vetting, uh, we saw many cases of outright fraud, bait and switch substitution of products, boxes marked N95, but really KN95 or worse, no delivery or, or delayed delivery causing even more open market purchases to be made. Um, I heard of one shipment that was hijacked from uh, the dock from a state when another buyer outbid the purchase right there next to the ship. And integrity of the product was in question because we couldn't even rely on the supplier and no testing like uh, the underwriters laboratories was available for what we were receiving. Uh, New Mexico Department of Health was put in charge. They were the lead agency for purchasing state PPE and medical supplies and Homeland Security was in charge of uh, running the state stockpile and making sure that we had enough goods uh, at, at the ready. Um, I coordinated with the National Association of State Purchasing Officials as one of the 50 states members, and we compiled notes on vendors, shared fraud cases, and made a list of what we considered reliable supply sources. Next slide. So uh, how can we recover? Well, many businesses have ceased operations, a disproportionate amount of minority and veteran and Hispanic and tribal African-American black and women-owned businesses have collapsed in New Mexico. Uh, General Services Department drafted legislation this session, it's still in process, to keep more New Mexico taxpayer dollars in New Mexico and help homegrown businesses recover, grow, and create jobs for New Mexicans. Next slide. Um, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but basically our, our Senate Bill 53 uh, tries to give some preferences to certain businesses and to try to target small businesses to regrow our economy post COVID. Um, next slide. Um, we are doing a massive outreach to try to get vendors to register with state purchasing so that they can share in some of the spend. You can see about a dozen organizations here that we've been giving uh, presentations to. I give most of them and then I share the uh, registration process with my staff and I'll illustrate what that is. Next slide. 
These are brochures that we put out. Um, so we have the Q&A, we have a customer service liaison that I'll share with you at the end of the slides. Um, this is how vendors participate in the solicitations. Next slide. That's just the back side of it. Um, the next slide, please. And there you have our contact information and any of us will direct you to how, um, how businesses can then engage with the state. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. I stand for questions when ready. Thank you, Mark. If I recall correctly, Stephen, you are up next. Okay. Let me just share my screen. All right. Can everyone see the slides okay? Yes. Awesome. So I'm Steven Stoddard, and it's great to be with you today. I'm excited to tell you a little bit from uh, the rural hospital perspective, what we experienced on the supply chain and specifically PPE uh, challenges. But first, just a little background about the network. Um, we're based here in Albuquerque. And of course, my favorite event uh, is our uh, local international balloon fiesta. Uh, each year. So that's why I included a, a picture of that. But hopefully that'll come back this year or possibly next year uh, to uh, uh, enjoy uh, in this state. Um, our uh, network was founded in 2011. We had six original hospital members. Um, we received a network development grant from HRSA at that point. And then they went ahead, the CEOs that have been running our network said, let's hire an executive director. Uh, so I was the first one hired uh, as our executive director for the network uh, back in 2015, and we now have uh, 10 hospital members in the network. Uh, so who are our members? Uh, here's a list of the facilities. Uh, they're scattered all over the state, very small um, to medium-sized facilities. Uh, our smallest one is um, Guadalupe County Hospital, 10-bed hospital over in Santa Rosa, and then our largest one is Rehoboth McKinley over in Gallup. Uh, and so here's a map of our locations. Uh, and as you can see, we are very spread out. Um, Albuquerque, where I'm based and our headquarters for the network is at, is somewhat central, but we are very spread out, lots of distance between our facilities. Uh, but the commonalities with our hospitals are the fact that they're all rural, they're all nonprofit, and they're all independent facilities. Uh, so here's some pictures of the hospitals. This is Rehoboth down at the bottom uh, over in Gallup. This is Norley uh, over in Lovington. Artesia is where Kimberly is at. Uh, this is a picture of her hospital there. And this is Guadalupe County Hospital, the smallest one uh, in the state. So our mission, we focus on to sustain and support that quality healthcare and our communities through collaboration. And definitely the key word in our network's mission is collaboration. Uh, we work closely together. And one of the ways that we do that, uh, we do a lot of group purchasing together, networking, uh, contracting. But uh, over time, I've established uh, 16 active peer network committees that each meet regularly. Uh, and so these committees are uh, peers from each of those 10 hospitals. Uh, and so we meet regularly, we already have relationships in place. Uh, and typically most of our meetings are already virtual. So changing to the pandemic wasn't that big of a deal for those committees. Um, although we do miss the once a year in-person meeting that each group has had in the past. Our materials directors committee has been extremely active, especially early on. Uh, in the pandemic. And that's where a lot of our PPE focus has uh, been and, and uh, worked through. So back in March, one year ago, what was our main concern? Um, it was PPE. Yeah, that was one of the, the main concerns, obviously as slowing down the risk and educating our communities, trying to work through things, making sure we had enough staff. A lot of those issues have been a full marathon for especially rural hospitals. Uh, as uh, Mark explained, I think very well, the supply chain literally broke down. It was not normal, it was not working. Uh, our rural hospitals typically uh, were put 
on allocation for their supplies. So that meant even if they order a routine order or a little bit more than they normally did, that that meant uh, the supplier would send what they had, what they could, when they could. Uh, it was typically very late. It was typically very small. And it was often not even the exact product that they had ordered. Uh, and so those were some of the uh, challenges that popped up immediately uh, when the pandemic hit uh, New Mexico and the whole country. So some of the things of PPE include, of course, we're familiar with masks, um, gloves, of course, gowns, face shields. You can see some of those on the picture on the right. Um, goggles. I think some of our hospitals have PAPRs, they're called. They're kind of a full hood respirator uh, where they have a, literally a machine that helps pump in the air to that. And it's, they almost look like a spacesuit uh, that some of the uh, providers can wear and clinicians can wear. And then of course, things like hand sanitizer. Those are all big concerns, especially as the pandemic broke out and supplies became limited, prices were jacked up. Uh, and then it became a, a challenge. So some of the solutions that we came up with working with our materials directors uh, were number one, we decided let's do our own group order. We're used to doing group purchasing together as a network. We went ahead and did a group order directly from China. It had a lot of hassles. It was not the easiest thing to do. There were times that we were promised we'd have it within 14 days. It was more like um, 40 days <laughs> you know, that it took to get that. I think it was 48 days in the end. So uh, it took a lot longer. We had a lot of concerns, a lot of delays. Uh, we didn't know if it would actually arrive, but it finally did. Uh, and so that was good. It was helpful to have that uh, supply. Um, we did it as a group. So it came to my office in Albuquerque, and then we were able to help our hospitals get that distributed out to everyone. Uh, other things, uh, I went ahead immediately because uh, when the initial lockdown happened, there were dentist's office that were required to be closed except for emergency procedures. Uh, so I solicited a, a number of different dentists in the Albuquerque area to see if they had any extra masks or gloves that they'd be willing to donate to the rural hospitals. And, and by doing that, we were able to get quite a few just donated uh, to our facilities. Uh, another thing that we worked on was making sure that we shared information among our materials management directors. Uh, they, uh, like Kimberly and some of the other uh, directors, would find different opportunities. They'd find a supplier that actually was able to provide an N95 mask or gloves or other things that they needed, and they were successful and a, a good price. And so that information was shared uh, so we could know what was working and, and uh, uh, kind of direct our efforts that way. Uh, the other thing was just sharing best practices of how to reuse and reprocess PPE items. Uh, you know, one of the things we learned from some of our hospitals, rural hospitals, is they don't have huge quantities, but they, some of them purchased small boxes uh, that uh, had, could treat the N95 masks with uh, UV light. And they were able to treat those, reprocess them, use them again. Uh, other items like that were, were used quite often as well. Different ways to reprocess and keep using. And then also, um, some of the hospitals even went to the point of having employees and community members sew up homemade masks. Uh, you know, they, uh, one of the hospitals ended up using, since they were required by the state to close down uh, all elective surgeries, they used some of the surgical um, drapes that had uh, filtering material in them, and they used that as filters in these homemade masks that they were sewing uh, at these rural hospitals. And then we shared among our members uh, videos of how to do it. So other hospitals could pick that up and, and uh, follow suit and make sure that their staff were taken care of. Another thing I was really impressed about and excited uh, was literally, uh, early on in the pandemic, I was approached by a high school student here in Albuquerque uh, who said, I want to help. I want to be a part of a solution. Um, and what can I do? And she actually decided to sew uh, over 150 homemade masks. She followed the CDC guidelines that were available, donated those to our network. Uh, in addition, she and her family and friends wrote a whole bunch of homemade notes 
uh, of, of encouragement, cards, that sort of thing for the patients and the staff that we shared uh, with our hospitals. And then she even made a financial contribution as well to the network. So I was thrilled to see that younger people and teenagers uh, found ways to help uh, during the crisis and make a difference and make an impact. Another great partnership I was thankful for was we were able to get connected with the New Mexico COVID-19 Emergency Supply Collaborative. Uh, and this uh, group uh, was set up by numerous uh, leaders of the state as well as uh, partners. Uh, Sandia Labs was involved, the Air Force Research um, location was involved. So several different entities, UNM, universities and so forth. And they created this entity to collect donations of PPE or even in some case make hand sanitizer and things like that. Uh, and then get those out to the healthcare uh, providers uh, across the state. And one of the challenges was getting those to the rural areas. And so I was able to partner with them, help distribute some of the uh, items that they received and donations they received to our rural hospitals and also to some of the rural communities. So just literally in January, we received our largest donation uh, through the collaborative. They had a very large donation of masks and I was, uh, they uh, set aside a full pallet for our rural hospitals, which was 36,000 masks. Uh, so those are just a few photos of, of distributing and getting those out to some of the hospitals. So lessons learned uh, from this whole experience. Number one, uh, collaboration has been extremely important. I've been really happy to see how much collaboration has happened. Uh, I've never seen this level of collaboration in healthcare my whole career. Uh, and to me, that's been very encouraging. And I think that's one of the reasons that we've been able to get through this together. Uh, and things are very uh, much improved was all of the effort, all the collaborating from the state, from the local uh, governments, from the healthcare entities, uh, so on and so forth, and the public, the volunteers, others. Uh, definitely one issue that became uh, widely uh, known, uh, I think, was just that the fact that the U.S. and other countries rely so much on PPE from one country, from China. And I think that that can create a lot of challenges. It did create a lot of challenges because when they started having uh, outbreaks in China, they didn't want to share with the rest of the world. They just, the government closed it down. They had other issues as we saw with fraud, lots of uh, fake uh, items that were produced. And so I think some of that uh, really helped open the eyes uh, to the rest of the world that, you know, it might be wise to diversify and have some local fat manufacturing capability or uh, at least Western countries as well. The other thing uh, is I think extraordinary times and challenges have definitely been met by extraordinary people uh, to help our hospitals uh, stay open, to help our hospitals take care of their patients and take care of the communities. And, and really uh, people that are often just uh, in the background really have become heroes uh, for the nation and for all of us. And so I'm grateful for that. I appreciate the chance to uh, speak with you today and look forward to taking questions later on. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Kimberly, are you able to share your slides? I don't have any slides. <laughs> that Then that is even better. No issues <laughs> to share. Sorry about right. that. I'm just here to answer questions. That sounds great. Renee, would you like to go next? Sure. Share my screen here. Stetson, can you see presentation? Yes. All right. Thank you everyone for inviting me to um, take part in this panel today. My name is Renee Ayala and I'm the quality manager and infection preventionist for UNM Medical Group. And I'm just going to give um, a quick snapshot of UNM Medical Group pre-COVID, um, some of the struggles that we faced during COVID and where we're at with our recovery. So a quick snapshot of UNM Medical Group. 
um, the UNM Medical Group, we're the faculty practice plan of the UNM School of Medicine. We're one of the clinical arms of UNM Health System. We have 15 different clinics and our clinics um, are various types of services from dental to primary care, behavioral health and specialty clinics. And we also have three different administrative locations. So pre-COVID, uh, the way our ordering um, practices were is we had each clinic was responsible for their individual ordering from two main vendors. And then we have um, UNM Hospital that we were able to use as an alternate vendor when we thought about N95 use, um, we followed OSHA's requirements for fit testing at um, higher and annually. Our, fit, our N95 use was minimal. Our PPE use with the exception of gloves and um, was really very, very minimal. Uh, and this system really worked for us. It worked well. Um, we didn't use things like isolation gowns very frequently because we didn't have a lot of the same um, procedures taking place that hospitals do. So it worked well for us until COVID hit. And then once COVID hit, um, the first thing the health system decided is we needed to have alignment. Uh, so we instituted emergency operations centers at the different organizations. So UNM Medical Group had our own EOC, which then fed into a joint operations center for the entire health system. And with that, we were able to make decisions quickly regarding uh, PPE supplies, testing supplies, guidelines, algorithms, everything that kind of was encompassed in the COVID pandemic, what we needed to keep our patients and our staff safe. So the first thing that we really had to do was this huge push for N95s for all of the clinical staff. Um, so that was ensuring we had fit testing on file for everyone and they had the N95 in the training and were ready to use it. Very quickly, uh, based on guidance from CDC, it was determined that we didn't need N95s unless we were taking care of COVID patients or patients under investigation. So we had to quickly kind of change our PPE guidance um, and then we instituted masking for all staff. I will say that the PPE guidance that was coming out from the various um, entities such as CDC, WHO and some of the larger health systems in the United States was changing. So therefore ours was changing multiple times a day to ensure we had best practices in place. Um, we also had to look at different PPE guidance for our COVID or our patients under investigation versus our non-COVID patients. So in the medical group setting, we had one clinic that was continuing to see these patients and our other clinics were not. So we had to tailor our PPE guidance um, to fit the needs of each individual clinic. And with that also came training and then PPE supplies. So how do we ensure we had gowns for one clinic but not for another? Um, and then when we think about testing, the testing requirements were changing. And um, at one point we had to divert all of our swabs and our viral transport media to the hospital um, to ensure that they had that for adequate collection. And then to continue on in our COVID, um, very, very quickly we started to see allocations and back orders for items from our vendors. Um, like some of our other panelists have spoken about our vendors put us on allocation for the items that we had previously been ordering. So if it was something we had not been ordering, we were not able to get it at all. And what we also realized is that our vendors were putting us on allocation as, a, as a, an entire organization. So even though we had different ship locations from, for our individual clinics, we were all considered one organization. So if one clinic ordered five boxes of masks and another clinic ordered 10 boxes of masks, but our allocation was only um, five, they would cancel our entire order and we got nothing. So what we did to respond to this is we created a centralized materials management um, where we had a single location um, and, a, and a couple people ordering for all of our clinics. And then we had those supplies shipped to our main location. And then at that point we were um, using our vehicles to drive uh, the PPE supplies to the individual clinics. We had to do this to ensure that we could maximize our allocation um, from our different vendors. And then with this came PPE reuse and extended use um, and a lot of discussion throughout the health system and throughout the country on how do we ensure that the, the single use PPE um, is safe for our staff and for our patients as we reuse, whether it was ultraviolet light or hydrogen peroxide sterilization or just reusing of procedure masks day after day, keeping them in an aired location um, throughout the evening to air out. 
and bent out. We also had to report um, our PPE inventory daily, so up through the health system and then up through uh, the state of New Mexico. And at times we had to allocate um, our, some of our supply into the, hospital with the, the hospitals within the UNM health system, so SRMC and UNM. Um, and then let's see, I'm looking at my notes really quickly. Cleaning supplies. Uh, so that was another um, item that became on back order and how we had to come up with uh, creative ways to ensure that we were able to clean our clinic spaces. We um, purchased electrostatic sprayers from one of our vendors that we could use um, to disinfect our clinic spaces. Uh, we also had to work with um, some local pharmacies, compounding pharmacies, to uh, purchase hand sanitizer um, because a lot of the the hand sanitizer, the Purell that we normally were getting was not available. So we worked with some of our local pharmacies for hand sanitizer. And we also had to do large purchases of N95s and procedure masks from um, some of these other vendors that, ca that came directly from China that we were not familiar with before. And we had to be very mindful of those manufacturing practices, um, like our other speakers have said, to ensure we didn't have fraudulent uh, materials. And then kind of where we're at now, so for recovery, we are still um, doing daily inventory counts. We are still modifying our PPE guidance based on best practices. Um, cleaning supplies, we're still trying to make sure we have a consistent supply of wipes and cleaning supplies. And as we expand our clinic capacity, we're having to ensure that we have excess inventory, um, trying to plan for resurgence and ensuring that we have things like gloves and, um, and gowns on hand. And that is all I have today. And I'll stand for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Renee, and thanks everyone for presenting. Um, we're gonna move into the next stage of this and that's going to be turned over to Angelica. Angelica is gonna be president next year. So uh, get familiar with her, you'll see her face for sure. And I'm gonna let her introduce herself. Her company was recently changed and bought up and I don't wanna butcher her title or anything that's going on now. So I'll let her introduce herself, but we're moving into questions and I thought this was really cool to see the differences from the state to the rural to a large UNM enterprise wide. And now we're gonna drill in with some more specifics and feel free any questions you have to put in the chat, but we have some already geared up and I'll let Angelica take it from here. Hi everybody, I'm Angelica Brunke. I'm the president of the RS21 Health Lab. I was formerly CEO of Versatile Med Analytics, a company I co-founded but was recently acquired by a local tech company here in Albuquerque. Um, like Pre uh, Stetson mentioned, um, president-elect this year, so very excited to, to kick off more events like this. And so any feedback that you all have on either things that you want to see more of or hear more of, just please don't hesitate to send that our way. So with that, I, I want to thank all of the presenters for, um, for, for putting just so much thought into participating in this event. It's, it's very clear that, it, at least for me from listening to these presentations, that when you think supply chain, maybe a sliver of, of all that was discussed would immediately pop into my head. So just the amount of work that you all went through in order to, to help your organizations and your community communities is just so commendable. Um, things like communication and collaboration with organizations you never thought you'd have to collaborate with, um, the human element of that high school student writing thank you cards or, or notes to, to patients, that's, um, that's something that's very heartwarming to see because I think we all just, you know, we got caught up in the survival mode and it's, it's really awesome to see how, how we all came together. So with that, we will jump into the question portion. And Angelica, I'm going to interrupt you real quick for a housekeeping item. We'll be ending at 125. So Stacy can do um, a couple minutes of wrap up. I just wanted to say that because I know this will probably, okay. it could go all day because these are going to be interesting. <laughs> Thank you, Stetson. 
All right, I do want to have a chance to hear from Kimberly a little bit. I know Kimberly, you mentioned before you can talk supplies all day and it's just hearing your perspective from coming from a rural hospital. We definitely want to hear, you know, what was the most challenging process that you managed at Artesia? So I think the most challenging part when the when this all started was we were just recently getting past um, Hurricane Maria and the allocations that came with that. So just when we thought we were done with that, the pandemic hit and once it hit, it was a whole new baby. But I I mean, my staff and I have talked about it before and it, Maria did help prepare us a little bit for the pandemic, but not as much as we thought it was going to. Um, so I think the scariest part would have been not being able to get routine supplies that you never really needed at all. You couldn't find them, you couldn't borrow them from other people, you, they were just gone. Um, and then just trying to keep up with what you could and couldn't have and using all these vendors, you know, you try in materials, you try to stay with just standard vendors and you had to go to Amazon. You had to go to the paint store. You had to, I mean, we were doing everything we could all day to try to find stuff. We were working till 10 o'clock at night trying to find supplies. So we went from a department that nobody really recognized to a department everybody replied, relied on. So that was rough. <laughs> and it happened all at once. <laughs> so anyway, thank you for having me. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, on that note, this question will be for, for the panel so we can go around, but um, all of these vendors popped up and what happens, and, and of course we don't wanna take the negative spin on it, but what happens if there's another outbreak, if there's a COVID part two, all of these vendors will eventually become defunct, the ones who popped up and started selling supplies. Are there contingency plans that your organizations are putting in place for to prepare for that event? If you want to raise your hand, whoever wants to go first. So I'll, I'll, I'll jump in, Angelica. So what we've talked about on a national level, since there seemed to be a bit of a leadership vacuum on, on how to allocate what resources we had, how to get American manufacturing in gear, the National Association of Gover Governors in coordination with the National Association of State Procurement Officials are now trying to create a stateside FEMA equivalent so that we can manage our own supplies if we need to pivot quickly mm -hmm. going forward. That is one of our solutions to try to figure out domestic production, allocation of resources, and expediting uh, the orders so we don't have to wait for, for some other decision from up on high. We can act quickly. Thank you. That's really great to hear. Stephen, Renee, do you have any any thoughts on that? Sure. Um, here at the UNM Medical Group, we have beginning to put together a type of stockpile for N95s. Now that um, certain reliable vendors have their products more readily available, um, we've created a stockpile in the event of research. And I would just add one thing that's been interesting is prior to the pandemic uh, in supply chain, there was a big push to just in time inventory, that that's the way to go. You, you don't carry the cost of having lots of supplies on hand. Uh, you, you let the uh, vendor take care of that. They just bring it to you the same day that you order it or the next day that you order it. And that's been nationwide a huge push by uh, that industry is supply chain is just in time, just in time. And it works great until you need a lot more. Uh, and as we saw with the pandemic, that it doesn't work well in that environment um, in having that just in time inventory because uh, it's not there in time and it's not there even when you need it next month. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think one thing our rural hospitals have done a lot more of is keeping more, having a bigger stock. Uh, making sure that they are not caught, uh, you know, without being prepared. Uh, and so, you know, as I've visited and, and taken uh, donations and things around to the hospitals, their supply uh, warehouses and, and storerooms are a lot fuller, uh, especially with PPE than, than they used to be. And that's a good thing. And it's great that they have it there. It's great that they have it on hand. 
but they're they're carrying a higher inventory on purpose to be more cautious. That's so that brings up another question. It's great to have that higher inventory on hand now. Are there any concerns about security of where this inventory is being housed? I mean, Mark mentioned hijacking at docks. I mean, we we saw a, a new side of um, risk that we haven't before. Are there any concerns on how that equipment is going to be protected? I can speak from a state perspective. We have a warehouse through our Homeland Security Department that is right next to the National Guard. It's a pretty robust uh, security to get through to, to have access for the most part, unless somebody um, maybe has a helicopter and, and somehow pulls that out from the air, I think it's pretty secure. So I, that, that piece of it's okay. What I really worry more about is, is the steady flow of US made materials. We, um, we've really offshored everything. And uh, thankfully that we have some US manufacturers that were able to pivot and start making these things. But I think that is the focus so that we can control our own inventory and not rely on overseas suppliers. What about you? Oh. I'm sorry, real quick, I can speak to some of the security that we're doing at UNM Medical Group. Early right. on, um, we very liberally had hand sanitizer, masks, gloves out in all of our exam rooms, um, and we found those items disappearing very quickly, unfortunately. Um, so what we've done in our clinics is just to ensure that, they, that the providers have the hand sanitizer that they need um, and the pair of gloves before, and any PPE before they walk into the building or into the exam room, we don't have things readily available um, like we did before. Gotcha. What about you, Kimberly? If you ask anybody at my hospital, it's on complete lockdown. They don't even know where I hide it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I would also add, um, Angelica, it was interesting, especially early on in the pandemic, uh, when, when I would deliver donations to some of the hospitals, they stored it in a different place quite often that was more locked down than the normal supply, uh, you know, oh. supply storehouse area. Uh, and, and just to have a separate store that was a little more protected, a little more removed from, and a little less accessible to staff. Uh, and so, so that I've seen that uh, fairly commonly among some of our hospitals. That's interesting. That reminds me of, um, so I'm uber paranoid. And if I'm leaving town, if I have something valuable, like maybe equipment or what whatnot, I'll hide it in just some a linen closet. Let's we'll give that as, as an example. So nobody here robbed me. But um, yeah, putting supplies where you just wouldn't think to look, that's a really good idea. Um, let's see. So something that I found really interesting in reading your all bios and hearing about your experience is that really none of you have you know set out to go to school or have careers in supply chain, but here you are just deeply immersed and involved in that. I'm curious what from your background and experience, how did that change your perspective or, or did it at all and how you approach these situations that you were tasked with? And I'm gonna pick on Mark because he's unmuted, so. <laughs> Fair enough, Angelica. <laughs> um, yeah, my, my background uh, is, is more on the legal side of the equation. And um, there was an opportunity at State Purchasing to join. And I think the segue there was they needed an attorney to, to handle their protests. And so I, I, I knew the law, I knew research, I knew how to write. And, and that's how I got my toe in, into the purchasing world. And from there, um, now, instead of interpreting the laws, uh, I'm making the laws and working with the legislature to refine the procurement code. I'm also advising agencies on what tools they have uh, within the procurement code to act quickly. And one of the things that we saw used, maybe arguably abused at some point, is the emergency procurement rules. And, and that, that, that's designed for exactly this kind of thing, a pandemic. Um, how that's done though, and how long, how long is an emergency? Is it one year, is it two years, or is it something less? That yet has to be seen. And we have to get back to a run rate because now we know 
what we need to do and how to do it, it's no longer an emergency. And we're, I think the press has been criticizing um, some of the, the state agencies in that field. Um, and I'm, I'm going a little bit far afield for how I got here. So uh, <laughs> the, le the legal link is, is how I wound up here. And uh, I think the job of being a director of the state purchasing division and, and trying to manage about 30 people is, is I've taken everything I think I've learned in my life and applied it to this job at some point. Uh, so it has been fulfilling in that respect. And um, I do feel good about helping the New Mexico citizenry. Thank you. Awesome. What about Donnie? We haven't had a chance to hear from you and your background with the military experience. That's um, how you apply that to processes, I'm sure provides unique perspective. Right, you know, there's nothing worse than uh, receiving a call at 1030 at night from the governor's office asking you to uh, get involved and operationalize the state's contact tracing effort uh, and then having a plan uh, that you can brief to the governor on that following Tuesday. So uh, I think, you know, my experience uh, over the years as a logistics officer, but more importantly, uh, my operations and logistics experience in Afghanistan along the Pakistan border really, really gave me an opportunity to really understand uh, what it's going to require in regards to developing the system and making sure, you know, you heard Mark say that we had to have laptops to all, for all our contact tracers. You had to get them out without folks coming to a central point. So a, a lot of the experience I shared, I had with the, uh, in Afghanistan, pushing out all the equipment, establishing fire bases, uh, ensuring that soldiers were trained and those kind of things really, really helped me put, uh, put together a plan for the state of New Mexico. Um, you know, one thing that's important is that the federal government at the time was suggesting that the state of New Mexico needed over 600 contact tracers based on our population. So how are we going to get 600 people into a workforce uh, was, you know, something we had to work through. And quickly we recognized 600 was just too much. You know, we needed more than 25, but what was that magical number? And I think everybody can appreciate when you would see a map on the news of New Mexico green and the rest of the country was red. You know, um, the governor's office would suggest to me, hey, Colonel Quintana, I think you're going to have to lay off some of your contact tracers because our numbers were low. And I said, you know, eventually what's going to happen with that little island of green is it's going to be overtook by red. And obviously it did, right? Uh, our numbers went from 100 and some in late August to 3,000 last November. So making sure that we had adequate uh, capacity and so forth. But I really think that uh, I leaned a lot on my operations and military experience mm -hmm. to ensure that we were looking at it from a very macro perspective and uh, looking at it wholly inclusive. But uh, yeah, it, it, it is a lot. Logistics, you know, I often uh, would suggest to soldiers in the battlefield, it's great, but if you don't have ammunition and the food mm -hmm. and the equipment you need, you are not gonna be successful, you know. The last example I'll leave you with is uh, during my career, I commanded a heavy equipment transportation company and uh, that moves the M1A1 battle tank. In, oh. in, in, and I can tell you it cost a thousand dollars back then in the 1980s, dating myself, to drive a tank one mile. Thousand dollars of fuel. <laughs> So, you know, making sure that you uh, address all the logistics is extremely important. But uh, yeah, I really leaned a lot on my military career to be able to help us get through the process. So thank you, Angelica. When are those tanks going to go electric, Donnie? <laughs> <laughs> solar, right? Solar or wind. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Donnie. Do any of the other panelists want to, to share on that piece before we move on to the next question? I will really quickly. And for me, um, in my infection prevention role in the medical group, it was more, um, I felt very, a personal connection to our staff. We had staff who were very concerned and rightfully so um, for their health coming into work each day. And for me, it was just, what can we do to make sure that they're protected and our patients are protected and how do we think outside the box? And really just getting it done. Um, and so that that was kind of my, my direction for me. Yeah. Okay. And Renee, your, um, your background especially stood out to me. I think it was what 
laboratory science is what you went into and then you just mm -hmm. kind of you end up here so it, it's just so interesting to me our our experience seemingly unrelated and how it influences how we interact and all right i'm going to move on here a common theme has been establishment of new processes and we all learned new ways to do things because we had to is is there any process or procedure that was established at your organizations that is here to stay if i may uh Definitely a Department of Health. One is the new database system that they, uh, we developed uh, to be able to capture all the data needed uh, for any virus. Um, so that definitely is incorporated within their system. But just as importantly, um, Department of Health has established a bureau just to deal with COVID and viruses and they manned it or staffed it with 50 additional new people. So their department mm -hmm. grew. Uh, they recognize that they definitely had, need to have the capacity to be able to respond. So, yeah, I think, uh, you know, folks learned the lesson. And I think Mark and everybody, Stephen and Renee and Kimberly and everybody on the panel has been able uh, has articulated it, is that we learned a lot of lessons, right? We were ill prepared for something like this. It snuck up on us. But the best thing you could do is be resilient and ensure that you have adequate processes into the future. And being able to look around the corner to see what that brings in the future is important. And I think uh, we've implemented a lot of processes and procedures and more importantly, just the ability to think forward into what mm -hmm. happens if this happens again. So yeah, I think there's a lot of processes. We're gonna have to come back to that one, Angelica. There's some data questions in the chat. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. Kimberly, uh, do you have a comment on that? Any processes that are now here to stay as a result of, of what was learned in the pandemic? I think the biggest thing is the ability to adapt to new things daily. Um, we get so stuck in our routines, but we learned with the regulations that came out daily that you have to be willing to quickly change what you're used to. Absolutely. Angelic, I'll chime in, I'll chime in as well. Um, normally, people think of state purchasing as using cost as the real determining factor on which awards are selected, but really it's best value to the state. And so looking at a balanced portfolio, if you will, of vendor suppliers, uh, adding domestic manufacturing to that portfolio, I think going forward is one thing that we'll be focused on. Oh, that's great to hear. On the um, on the note of you know what's being done in New Mexico, Mark, when you shared your presentation and you listed all those organizations where you spoke at or presented at, you know, trying to get the word out about SWP and things of the like. Me being a, a recent business owner, um, I hadn't hadn't heard of maybe half of those organizations, and so. What's, what's a good way to help spread that word? I don't know, what are your thoughts on that? I don't know how large those organizations are, but being a, a female minority owned business owner, like I said, I wasn't aware of most of those. Well, I'm fortunate to be in an administration where my, my boss is Secretary Ken Ortiz and he's all about outreach and trying to spread the word. And so if there's an organization that would like a presentation by state purchasing, we, we are there to do that. And we had planned, um, this was actually in place early March, we had met with about a dozen departments and we said, how can we do a Buy New Mexico campaign where we can get the word out that we can, we can at the same time have the message sent to everyone that we're open for business, we want to engage, we want to help businesses. Uh, you know, economic development was there with us. Uh, the, um, the tourism was there. And so we were gonna to put together this big event and because of COVID that didn't happen. So what we've been doing are these one-offs and we'd be happy to reach out to anybody. The Hispano Chamber has been great to work with. Uh, the American Indian Chamber of Commerce in Albuquerque has been great to work with. Uh, I've gone out to Window Rock just before I, the, the state shut down uh, for their economic summit uh, with the, the Navajo Nation. So we, we would like to engage with as many business organizations as we can 
and we're we're available to schedule something if if that's uh, of value. Awesome, that's great to hear. Uh, let's see, we've got some questions in the chat, and of course, here's here's Stephanie, who's always data minded, and this question is for you, Donnie. Um, where do you feel our state quickly made leaps and bounds, and where do you think we still have work ahead as far as data? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So thank you for that question. You know, uh, you know, early on, uh, obviously the driver was HIPAA, right? Ensuring that uh, as we collected data on these patients that we were exercising to the greatest extent possible, safeguarding all of their PPEI. And that, that was huge in the creation and development of the database was ensuring that nobody can get into the database and get access to any of the information coupled with the fact that once we identified a positive case and that triggered the exposed contacts conversation, that we never ever gave out the information or the name of the individual that tested positive. We just said that you had been in contact with somebody. Uh, and then working with the state environment department uh, to identify that there was a positive case in a business, we never wanted to provide the business owner with the actual name of the employee mm -hmm. so that we could protect that. So I think overall, I think we've done a really tremendous job there at Department of Health, ensuring the safeguard of the data of the individuals that are either tested positive and so forth so that we can safeguard that information. In addition to that, uh, I think I saw somewhere in the chat, uh, being able to extract from the database uh, critical information on an ad hoc basis so that we could have dashboards uh, both from PPE, right? Uh, for all, every hospital had a report within a 24 hour period, all the PPE equipment that they had. Renee and, and Stephen probably know this better than I do and Kimberly, but uh, you know, having that information readily available to the decision makers and the policy folks in state government was really helpful so that we knew what we needed at what at any mm -hmm. given time. So I think we recognize that we need dat data immediately. And more importantly, we need to be able to share it with the folks that need to have that information. So we developed the system, the dashboards that would allow, that would be updated every five minutes. So if you were the governor or you were one of the senior leaders in the state, you could go look at that dashboard and you would have information that was refreshed every five minutes. Mm -hmm. So it was almost live information. So yeah, absolutely data plays a critical role, right? Because, but I guess the other thing I'll end with is we quickly recognize that raw data in itself without the analytics and the conversion from raw data to useful information doesn't mm -hmm. do a lot of good. So making sure that we present it in a fashion to take it from raw data, analyze it and convert it into information or decision-making uh, information was critical. Oh yeah, you're preaching to the choir here, Donnie. We, the sign <laughs> back here, do good with data. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, on that data note, I'm curious to hear from the rest of the panelists, what data do you wish you had that you didn't at the start of this? You know, how, how to create resiliency in our supply chain has to be powered by data. So I'm curious for, you know, you each touched different areas of this topic. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. I, I can jump in real quick, Angelica. And one thing I, you know, I think that was interesting was at the beginning of the pandemic, um, every government agency wanted the hospitals to report data directly to them. Uh, the federal government wanted certain reports and completed directly. The state wanted certain reports and information completed directly so that they had a, a better picture of what was happening uh, was supply chain, what was happening with PPE stocks and so forth. And, and I, one thing I was grateful for was the hospital association tried to streamline that. They realized that was overwhelming, especially for the rural hospitals to be able to, uh, to take care of, you know, just that data request every single day and so much information that had to be shared. Uh, and so they, they streamlined it through the state. So the state received all the information directly and then they passed on to the federal government what they needed. And that really helped. It really helped the people in 
the trenches uh, in the rural communities and, and hospitals that didn't have a lot of extra people to throw at uh, reporting and, and making sure that, that that was accurate. So that was one quick lesson that I think we learned uh, as a state and as an area that collaboration, that streamlining, uh, that's really important and, and really makes a big difference. Absolutely. I'll chime in next, and Angelica. Uh, it's interesting that I have a title of state purchasing agent, but I buy nothing. <laughs> I put in place the contracts that agencies use to buy the goods and services. And because of that, I don't have a line of sight to what the agency, Donnie knows what I'm talking about. I, I don't have a line of sight to what the agencies actually spend. Uh, it's been a problem. And one of the ideas years ago was these uh, uh, islands of, of uh, autonomy where, where, where the share system was sacrosanct and none of the information would be, would be uh, sent to me for analysis. I've since talked with DFA, I've talked with the Department of Information Technology, and we are going to implement a new procurement system that will have access to that data, whether it's in batch form or live is another question, but I will be able to finally, finally able to analyze data and find out where the money is going so that I can be a smarter purchaser of goods for the state. Mm -hmm. oh, that's awesome, that warms my heart. Good use of data. <laughs> Renee, Kimberly, did you want to comment on this? Any data that you wish you had at the at this outset of the pandemic? Or maybe even going forward? You know, for us at UNM Medical Group, um, because each of our clinics ordered independently of each other, it was difficult to develop burn rates um, and ensure that we had the PPE and supplies we needed to keep our clinics open. Um, so with our daily reporting, we've developed some dashboards internally uh, so that each clinic and senior leaders can track uh, the PPE usage and the quantities at each location. Um, so if we would have had a type of centralized materials management pre-pandemic, we would have had that data readily available as opposed to trying to develop it in the middle of um, implementing all our other guidelines and policies. But now that's in place, it so is. you at least, yeah. Yes. Awesome. Well, we are, we've got just a few minutes left and I'm watching the clock, Stetson. I want to get to this last question that we have in the chat, and this is for all of the presenters. Um, what weaknesses did you experience combating COVID and how will you use those lessons learned to improve in the future? So I'd say, what's your biggest um, weakness that you identified and lessons learned? I'll take a shot at that one, Angelica. Oh, so the weakness we had is the procurement code is really an, in, an imperfect tool for an emergency. There's really only one escape clause on that, and that's using the emergency procurement method and just tossing out everything else. Um, I think guidelines on how that's used to prevent abuse going forward is probably going to be something the legislature looks at and I think the state agencies ought to prepare for that. Uh, again, you know, when is an emergency actually over is, is a valid question. We're being challenged on that right now. So that's what I would say would be my weakness. And I guess if I could jump in, uh, I would think that uh, worldwide, and when it comes to data, the um, ELR or the laboratory test results that uh, message that had been established worldwide for all the information that is forwarded by these laboratories that do the testing is so finite and so rigid that we really we were really challenged at the beginning of being able to capture more information that we needed uh, than was available. And obviously we weren't gonna get the, the world to change their emergency laboratory reports just to accommodate the state of New Mexico. Uh, we met early on with the laboratories from New Mexico and asked them to modify their systems. And basically they came back to us and said, unless you make it a state law, we are not gonna do it. And the reason why was because it was cost ineffective for them to change their process. So being able to recognize that we, had, we need to have some more flexibility across the world 
and being mm -hmm. able to modify how we collect data. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I have to say this has been such an engaged event here. We've got lots of comments in the chat. I want to thank you all for taking the time and for, for speaking with us. Again, I just I appreciate all that you've done in this process. Again, when you think of supply chain, I wouldn't think of, of most of your roles, but you were such major contributors. So thank <laughs> okay. you. On behalf of NMHE, thank you for taking the time to be with us today. And I will hand it over to, who am I handing it over to, Stetson? Stacy. Stacy. <laughs> She's in the ACHE headquarters helping with the event. Thank you guys. On behalf of ACHE, I want to personally thank our chapter leaders that planned today's session, um, the moderator and the panelists, and of course, all of you for your participation. Um, please complete the evaluation. Um, I did place the direct link um, in the chat box and it will be open for one week. You can also access the evaluation by visiting your um, ACHE personal page and selecting my online learning. Um, from there, you will then click on access my courses link and you will be directed to our learning management system where you can complete the evaluation. In the same location, you will be able to access the recording of the session within two business days. Um, everyone who attended today's event in its entirety will receive the face-to-face -face credits within two weeks. Um, so that concludes our session, uh, which is copyrighted in 2020 by the American College of Healthcare Executives, all rights reserved. Thank you everyone for a great session. Have a good one. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Thank you. Bye. We'll, Bye. we'll post so it on much. NMHE's website as well. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye.